The Uncomfortable Truth A Detailed Study into the Rhodesian Viscount Tragedies My interest into the two aircraft crashes began with an online forum where there was a somewhat heated discussion about the two incidents and the follow-up actions by the military. Keith Nell wrote a book about the two crashes and published copies of some of the forensic reports, written by Donald Hollingworth. Hollingworth was one of the chief forensic policemen in the then BSAP. In the book, Vi Countdown, Nell quoted some security force war stories, which were good for the read and flow of the book, but were factually incorrect. Nevertheless the book raised certain questions. I will go through these questions and provide some answers. Firstly for those who don't know the circumstances under which the two Rhodesian Viscounts crashed, it was largely published that they were brought down by ground-to-air Russian-made missiles. These were said to be the SAM-7, or Strela 2M missile. The first attack occurred on 3 September 1978 and the second in February 1979. The first crash resulted in some survivors, 10 who were later gunned down by a local terrorist group. There were a total of 8 survivors from both the crash and subsequent terrorist attack. 48 people died. The second attack occurred on the 12th of February 1979, and resulted in a complete loss, of all the 59 lives of those on board. Zipra was the local terrorist group operating out of Zambia, and they were the first to claim the shooting down of the aircraft. By this time, the 4th of September, media was already touting the incident as a ground-to-air missile strike. I had watched a television interview given by Joshua Nkomo who was the head of the Zipra terrorist group. He had fumbled through the interview, filmed on the 5th of September, with Ian Black, an Australian journalist, claiming the passenger aircraft were legitimate targets. It was abundantly clear he had no idea, as to how his freedom fighters had brought down the aircraft. So let's have a look at the interview, and I apologize for the quality. And in the event, the government forces claimed that 10 survivors were gunned down by Zipra forces inside the country. That is true. Of course, that is not true. Mm -hmm. They are trying to conceal the fact that the plane was shot down. That's all they are trying to do. They are shot down by us. And they are trying to conceal that by saying uh, it, was civil, it was the people who were shot down, uh, the survivors. There's no such thing. Was the plane shot down by missiles? They were shot down by what we use. This is not Here only less than a month ago, um, were of some value. Others have a different um, view of them. Others uh, say who? Uh, they are prisoners of Ireland. Indeed. So the civilians could say others. Well, there are no others as a prisoner of Ireland. What's your What's your feeling about his comments about those forces, which were, of course, um, held in secret? This is This is traditional, of course, for prisoners to be classed in that manner. We are not surprised. That is 1963. All sorts of things. So. Uh, as President Yerun doesn't like the example, we take it. It's just that. This is what you're trying to do. If you saw there was value for the country and indeed for the future of your own people, if further talks of that kind with the instrument, would you go ahead with it? I don't ask for letters from other people, you know. <laughs> I, I, I do. I do what I say is useful for my country. And I'm not going to be told that. I had noted that when working on the timeline of events, that there was a newspaper article, from Pat Travers who was the Air Rhodesia manager at the time, claiming that Nkomo's statements were untrue. Rescuers arrived early the next day, and follow-up operations started the morning of the 4th of September. Elements of the Rhodesian Airways also arrived on the 4th of September, namely Captain Roy Downs, a seasoned Viscount pilot, and a qualified air crash investigator. Downs wrote to me after the book was published, and he wrote the following. At no time was I appointed a member of the Civil Aviation Accident Investigation Team on the Hunyani crash. In fact I have never even seen the final report on the event. I have no idea why I was sent with Phil Palmer from the DCA to search for the aircraft. I was simply told to do so by my operations manager, who never suggested that I should investigate the accident should we find the aircraft. The first forensic report was completed by Hollingworth on the 8th of September, up until that date it was pure speculation that a missile had caused the tragedy. So, how did Ian Black know on the 5th of September that a ground-to-air missile had been used? As a matter of fact Travers had said publicly that the pilots had not said they suspected a missile or any other weapon, and had they, they would have said so before crashing. 
I am a qualified forensic auditor, and I had also attended the Rhodesian School of Infantry. There we were trained in basic weapons, including Russian weapons like the AK-47, RPG-7 and SKS. Then later in my life I had worked in the South African security industry, where I attended a course which included an overview of the Strela ground-to-air missile. Sadly it was only a static demonstration and no live firing was undertaken. All of this experience gave me insight into the inaccuracies, of the forensic reports concerning the tragedies. To disprove what had been said, I had to find an authoritative and undisputable source. The obvious source was the Russian technical manual on the Strela missile system. Some three years later I managed to gain an original top-secret manual from the Ukraine at great cost. The problem was that it was all printed in Russian. As I had come this far on the project, I started to translate the manual from online sources, into English. This took ages. From there it became obvious I also had to upgrade my maths and physics from university. I had been closely associated with the Thornhill Air Base all my life, my dad had worked there. I also needed to find the Viscount Pilot and Operation Manuals, which I managed to purchase from a South African source. This was to understand the aircraft and its dart engines. And for the dart engines I needed an engine manual. These were purchased from Canada. So, what was wrong with the forensic affidavits or reports? Hollingworth wrote the following in his affidavit of the 8th of September. A Strela can reach an effective altitude of 4,600 meters. Well this is simply not true, its capability is 2,300 meters, but more likely 2,000 meters. One has to remember this was a defensive weapon not an attack weapon. It was used very effectively against slow and slow propeller-driven aircraft, like the Trojan. Then Hollingworth wrote that the shrapnel came from a Strela without any specific evidence, and I repeat any specific evidence. Shrapnel is subject to extreme high explosive forces is significantly deformed in an explosion, and would not look like anything in manufactured form. The pieces of a pineapple grenade would be similar to the pieces of a similar metal shape. Smaller pieces of shrapnel are almost melted to pellet shapes. The tiny pieces as quoted by Hollingworth would not match anything other than other tiny explosive pieces. This was junk science at its best. Hollingworth then goes on to write at the end of his affidavit, that the explosion was caused by a Strela. Yet there was no explosive residue that proved it and no definitive evidence from the shrapnel. There were no remains or evidence of the guidance system, no evidence of the propulsion chemicals, no parts from the winglet controls, no glass shards or pieces from the propulsion tube. Just the evidence of an explosion. I mentioned earlier that Captain Roy Downs had written a book on his experiences as a pilot. He also made note in the prologue of his book that he had experimented with detonators and explosives as a young man. So apart from his experience as a pilot and air crash investigator, he had at least some bush skills with explosives. After helping at the air crash scene he then writes in his book, that testing of explosives took place at Encomo Barracks on time used wings, or spars as they are called. I found this very interesting, because if Hollingworth had already determined per his forensic affidavit from the 8th of September, that the cause was a Strela ground-to-air missile. Then why waste time on testing explosives on old Viscount wings? Be reminded, that at the time of the testing of explosives on the wing spars, no substantive evidence had been found to prove it was indeed a Strela. Then Captain Roy Downs writes in his book that he was instructed to return to the crash site to gather further evidence. This was on the 26th of September. Now it's worthwhile to note here, that some aircraft crash evidence was removed from the site in the days following the incident. Yet here it seems, that a substantial piece or substantial pieces of the aircraft had been left on site. It became clear that no air crash protocols or investigative procedures were ever followed in the case of the Air Rhodesia tragedies. The protocols for investigating air crash investigation determined that certain procedures be followed, and a good example at the time was the Dag Hammarskjöld aircraft crash. There were several Viscount crashes in Australia, where similar processes were followed. Then following Downs's return to the crash site, he claims to have found pieces of shrapnel, one definitively belonging to the Strela. This was a sealing ring which Hollingworth describes in another affidavit dated the 20th of September, as being at the upper end of the propulsion tube but situated just below the warhead. I am not sure what piece Hollingworth was looking at, but there is no sealing ring in this position. There is a sealing ring just above the winglets, and between the steering system and electronic guidance section. There is another thinner sealing ring below the winglet steering system and the explosive section. Now to say the ring was below the warhead is wrong, unless Hollingworth was looking at the missile upside down. 
secondly anything below the warhead would have been blown backwards, and down from the explosive force, this is if the Strela was following Newton's laws. It would seem that the Rhodesian Strela missiles could defy Newton's laws in more than one way. The missile was quoted as having a range of 4,200 meters and still reached the altitude or height of 2,300 meters. Sadly this myth is also just that, a myth. The Russian technical manual categorically states its maximum height or altitude is 2,300 meters. There are other claims that are not true. A security force person once described the actions of the Strela optical eye as following his hand. Well the seeker optics head is only activated by arming the system, then pulling the trigger at which stage the seeker head is unlocked from its position, and start spinning. You certainly would not want to have your hand in front of the armed missile. Then there was the Elephant Hills Hotel incident where a Strela was thought to have been fired at a passing aircraft, but was attracted to the heat from the hotel's chimney or kitchen stove's ventilation system. The hotel had a thatched roof, and so any chimney or heat system, would have to vent at a relatively low temperature. Certainly below the 500 degrees centigrade minimum temperature, that would be required to initiate the seeking head. Then I looked at the positions of the shooters. Questions that sprung to mind were, how on earth did the terrorists know that the Viscounts would fly within Strela range? Were they sitting for days on top of the hills around Kariba Airport? Why did they not attempt to shoot aircraft landing? It would have been much easier. Did Nkomo hand out Strelas like lollipops as his troops left to terrorize the populace? To put this aspect into context I recalled my own army experiences. Generally the terrorists were ensconced close to local villagers. This was to access food and the villagers provided bedding and other amenities. Both general areas where the terrorists could have launched missiles from, were very remote and hardly populated. Secondly, they would have had to be on top of a hill to firstly see the aircraft coming and secondly to successfully launch the missiles. This was not their modus operandi. The Air Rhodesia pilots never flew the same route and it was constantly changed. So there was no chance of pre-determining the hill to sit on and to wait for the aircraft. Then there were launch time limits imposed by the aircraft speeds and in setting up the Strela. These time parameters are shown in the table, however a certain amount of time needs to be allocated on the aircraft approach and when to screw in the chemical battery. This can only be learned through experience and practice, something in short supply in the terrorist fraternity. While the Strela has a point and fire capability, one still needs to provide lead ahead of the target. The animation shows some basic steps. While the animation does not look like a long period of time, it actually covers 10 seconds. 10 seconds of a Viscount flying at 155 knots is 800 meters. If we take the whole time to get prepared to launch a missile at a count would have taken over a minute or roughly 4,800 meters. If it took 30 seconds, the Viscount would have traveled 2,400 meters. If the Viscounts were flying at 2,000 meters altitude, it would effectively place the aircraft out range of the Strela in most cases. The myth that the Strela was a super weapon is largely misplaced. The myth was propagated by people who failed to understand the weapon. The RPG-7 was a far more lethal weapon, used to shoot down the Puma in Operation Uruk, used to start the oil depot fire in Salisbury and to take down a Dakota in Mapai. While I have mentioned the RPG-7, Captain Roy Down seems to have not heard of the weapon. In a letter to me complaining about my book he wrote the following. I don't think I, and probably a number of my colleagues, had even heard of an RPG-7 at that stage of the war. So for the period from 1972 to 1980 he claims to have never heard or known about the RPG-7. This is a staggering claim, but nevertheless. A protocol of flying passengers around is to maintain a minimum safe altitude, when flying to and from each airport. This is known as the MSA. This is a document kept by pilots which has a whole range of data on it. I did not manage to find one for Kariba Airport, but here is the South African Airways one for Salisbury. The MSA is established by taking into consideration the altitude of hills, and other essential factors. During the Bush War this should have taken into consideration the range of the terrorist weapons to ensure the safety of passengers. For your information, the RPG-7 has a range of 700 to 800 meters or 2,300 feet. A DHSK machine gun has a range of 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet and, an AK-47 has a range of 350 meters or 1,100 feet. 
With the ranges of the weapons known at the time, it would have been safe practice to climb to at least 2,000 meters above known terrain features, as safely as possible. If you note that the one newspaper report states that five bullet holes were found in a passenger aircraft flying the same routes as the Viscounts. I highlighted all the major hill heights on both routes, to get an idea as to what height the aircraft would have to be to mitigate any ground fire. The hills are mostly at elevations of around 800 to 900 meters, which are some 400 meters above Kariba Airport's own elevation of 520 meters. Various sources quoted the Viscounts as flying low for up to 16 kilometers. This made no sense as it would endanger the aircraft from every terrorist weapon including the Strela. The climb rates of the Viscount are given as being between 1200 to 1400 feet per minute. The approximate 8-minute flights of each aircraft would put the aircraft at an elevation of some 2,800 meters at the time of the missile launches. At a low end climb rate calculation, the aircraft would have been at least 2,000 meters AGL. Whichever way one looks at it, this is on or above the maximum parameters of the Strela's performance. There was one final clinching factor. This involved the infrared radiation spectrum. While studying the physics of the spectrum I wanted to understand the infrared spectrum that the Strela could home in on, and its correlation to temperature emissions from the Viscount. It is a complex subject. The hottest parts of the Viscounts were the four engine exhausts. So what temperature did they vent at? This involved the DART engine manual. The hottest parts of a turbine engine are enclosed in a jacket which also has a cold condensed airflow flowing around it. And then the whole system is shrouded by nacelles. We know that the supposed missile struck the starboard inner turbine in the first incident. And in the second incident, the port inner turbine. Now ask yourselves why would a heat-seeking missile would fly past two outer engines, emitting a similar heat signatures and only home in on the inner ones? This is a heat chase missile, not a smart computer logic type as we have today. The infrared signature that the Strela can home in on is the 1 to 3 angstrom range. 10 angstroms measure 1 nanometer. Subsequent scientific research established that only temperatures above 600 degrees Celsius emitted wavelengths in the 1 to 3 angstrom range. The first generation missile models as the Strela 2 or Red Eye, scanned in just one range or color of the spectrum. Initially in the 2 angstrom band. While this enabled the seeker to distinguish between the IR radiation of the Earth at around 10 angstroms, the sun at around 3 angstroms and fighter jet at 2 angstroms for the tailpipe, 4 angstroms for the aft airframe and 4 to 8 angstroms for the exhaust plume. The missile was easily fooled by flares designed to radiate in this spectrum. These early seekers were only to detect the hot jet engine of the aircraft limiting it to tail chase engagements. Newer generation models switched to the 3 to 5 angstrom range like the Strela 3 and later added new to second and of wavelength to increase target discrimination. This meant, that the Strela could not see or home in on the Viscount's exhaust flume. Not only that the hot part of the exhaust vent was some 7 feet up inside the wing and turbine nacelle. But aircraft engineers had tested the Viscounts against a static Strela system and the aircraft was visible. Testing undertaken at CSI or Operatoria had determined that matte paint was the solution. All the tactical aircraft were painted in it. Color didn't seem to matter as long as it was matte. It was established that the silver surface of the Viscounts and possibly the gloss paint was the culprit. I returned to the second Viscount tragedy to see if there was any evidence there of the Strela homing in of the inner engine only. Hollingworth had written, that he was convinced the Strela had entered up the exhaust vent, and hit the low-pressure turbine blades and exploded. Well this is just ludicrous, the flight of Strela determines it wobbles in flight. So could not have entered the exhaust vent without exploding. Conveniently the engine struck by the Strela was not found. To summarize the findings, I noted the following. There are just too many inaccuracies and half-truths to say categorically it was a Strela ground-to-air missile. Everything, and I mean everything just did not add up. In the book I wrote about possible answers, one being sabotage. This didn't sit well with a number of people. They haven't spent seven years investigating the matter. Everything flies in the face of what we were schooled to believe. Some find the matter too painful to think about. For me it's been a journey and not a pleasant one. Part 2 to follow, The Sabotage Theory.